Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening, or morning or afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. I'm Natalie, and I'm excited to be your host today as we venture through the wonderful world of insects, mechanics, and more. I'm a postdoc in the Evolutionary Biomechanics Lab Group, and I'll shortly be joined by other members of the lab. I'll be leading them through a friendly debate of the qualities of the two main study organisms in the lab, clinging stick insects and leaf cutting ants. You might be wondering why insects and what can we learn from studying them? Insects are an important part of planet Earth. They predate the dinosaurs as the earliest insects evolved nearly 350 million years ago. In comparison, us homo sapiens are babies as we've only existed as a species for 200 to 300,000 years. Insects' long history on Earth has led to some incredible diversity. They come in many different shapes and sizes and feature innovations that make them a key part of the environment. With over a million species currently described and likely many more to be discovered, covering nearly every habitat on the globe, there is so much to learn from insects. To say it with a famous biologist, to a first approximation, all multicellular species on Earth are insects. Our lab studies two groups of insects to sneakily, sneakily extract their secrets, stick insects and leaf cutter ants. You may or may not have seen stick insects before because as their name suggests, they're masters of camouflage. To hide in tree branches, they harness their powers of adhesion, which is something our lab studies and we'll be talking more about today. The ants we study in the lab are not your average UK ants. They are part of a group of ants that are the world's first farmers. These ants cut leaves to maintain a fungus garden, which serves as their source of food. To tell us more about these insects, we have Dr. Ma Donna Maria Kaimaki and Hendrik Beck on Team Stick. Hi, Team Hello. Stick. Hello. Team Stick is a team of engineers specializing in nanoscience and biomimetics. Maria is a current postdoc in the lab, while Hendrik is a master's student. On Team Ant, we have Dr. Victor King, and Liv Welthouse. You can identify them with their ants in the background. Uh, you'll see we have a variety of fields represented in the lab as Victor has a background in biochemistry and zoology and Liv studied physics. So Team Ant is more of a team of scientists versus Team Stick of a team of engineers. I'll be leading Team Ant and Team Stick through a series of four questions where they'll have an opportunity to make their case for their insect. Full disclosure, I am not a completely neutral host as I currently study ants, but I'll try not to take sides today. As an audience member, however, you have an opportunity to decide, are you team ant or are you team stick? We'll be opening up a poll halfway through where you'll have an opportunity to vote, so get ready. We'll also be taking a quick break halfway through for our special musical number that some of the lab members of the lab put together. It should be a treat, so stay tuned. And please interact with us throughout the show. We love to hear any of your questions. Just pop them in the chat and we'll try to answer them at the end. Or maybe you've already decided that Team Ant is the best and you want to let us know. Might have taken a side there. All right, we also encourage you to tweet about the show. Just remember, tag us at Pine of Science and hashtag Pint21. That's it for me. Let's start getting into the questions. Starting with question one. What are the basic characteristics of your warriors? I think we'll go with Team Stick first. Henny, can you start us off? All right. Welcome, everyone. It is my pleasure to lead Team Sticks today into battle, even though they don't really need my help, as they can't be found on every continent in the world. OK, maybe apart from Antarctica. but. Apart from that, worldwide, approximately 3,000 stick insect species can be found. As the name suggests, these insects mimic their leaves and branches on which they live. Normally, you'd find stick insects in the tropics and subtropics, although several species also live in more temperate regions. The UK doesn't have any native stick, exams, stick insects, for example. However, over the last 100 years, three species that originated from New Zealand have become successfully established in Southwest England. Now, whether they live in the UK or somewhere deep within the rainforest of Australia, stick insects are mainly nocturnal creatures that spend most of their day motionless, hidden under plants. As they are very good climbers, they wander about during the night and feed on their favorite food. Can you guess? It's leaves, of course. 
Now, whether it is day or night, you would have a very hard time to spot them as they generally mimic their surroundings in color, normally green or brown, but also brilliantly colored. Many stick insect species have wings. Some are just a stump and have lost their original function. Others are spectacularly beautiful and enable them to fly. I mean, just have a look at this. Uh, isn't she a beauty? All right. Apart from having wings or being differently colored, stick insect species can also hugely vary in their size. The longest documented stick insect is 62 centimeters, whereas the smallest adult, can you spot it? Yeah, is, has only a body length 13 times smaller, about two centimeters. Well, to provide perspective, a human baby is about 15 centimeters, so only a factor of 3.5 shorter than the average adult. Well, no matter how large the adult, the adult becomes, all stick insects start small. After they hatch out of eggs, a newly born stick insect already closely resembles its adult form, except for their size, camouflage, and their wings. Insects cannot grow gradually because of their rigid outer skeleton, but need to shed it around six to nine times before reaching adulthood. The number of these moles depends on the species and the sex of the stick insect. Every time the stick insect sheds its outer skeleton, it can grow. Now, also, some insects, some stick insects have a very interesting way to produce offspring. The female can reproduce without needing a male. Fancy that, ladies in the audience. Well, the eggs she produces are unfertilized, but do develop properly and grow into an adult female stick insect. And again, depending on the species, the young stick insect might even be the exact genetic copy of their mother. This production of new individuals of, out of unfertilized eggs is called parthenogenesis, or less fancy, asexual reproduction. Okay, team ants, ending on a high note here, show me what you've got. Thanks so much, Team Stick. Very interesting stuff, but I think uh, team ants can take it from here. So, as Nat said, ants are an incredibly diverse uh, group of insects that are found on all continents, again, except from Antarctica. Now, I'm guessing not everyone has had the joy of staring at ant heads under a microscope, so we've used this collage to highlight the beauty and diversity of ants. Today, we want to talk specifically more about leaf atter ants in the genus Atta. Now, around 20 species of Atta have been described so far. They're normally found in parts of North and South America, but sometimes you can come across colonies in random places like research labs in London. In the wild, leaf cutter ant colonies can become very large with a single mature colony containing millions of individuals. And what's amazing is that the whole colony is produced by one single reproductive individual, the queen. All the other ants, the workers, are sisters. To put that into perspective, imagine one large city like London or Manchester where only one person has all the babies and all of the babies turn out to be female. Now, although they are sisters, atine ants um, of one species do not look the same. In fact, atta ants are polymorphic, which means they have a huge range in body size. In Atavolan Vidari, for example, the largest individuals can be over 100 times heavier than that of the smallest workers. To put that into perspective, that's about comparing the small of dog breeds, such as a Chihuahua, to the heaviest, such as an English Mastiff. So, you may be wondering what a metropolis of ants feeds on. Well, unlike the small brown or black ants you may find in your back garden, which feed on the sugary rewards of plants or by hunting other insects, leafcutter ants feed on something else entirely. Now, I know what you're thinking, surely they must eat the leaves that they work so hard to harvest, but surprise, surprise, they don't. Instead, they use these leaves to cultivate specific strains of fungi that they've done so over millions of years. So leafcutter ants could be considered the oldest farmers on earth, so to speak. Also, what's fascinating is the huge dependence that the ants and the fungi have on each other. This strains of fungi can't be found anywhere else in the wild, and leafcutter ant colonies can't survive on any other food. Now, in the same way that London consumes a large amount of food, an ant colony also has a huge demand. A mature colony can harvest 400 kilograms of plant matter per year to sustain its fungal gardens and itself. Now, this is a lot of leaves to cut. Fortunately, each forager is equipped with its own cutting tools, her sharp mandibles. The mandibles are so sharp that cutting through a given material with a brand new razor blade will take three times more force than using atta mandibles. Not only that, their enlarged head capsules are filled with muscles to help the ants slice through the materials. Now, I don't really think Team Stick can top that, so I think we should go to some crowd participation. We wanna hear from you guys. How long do you think it'll take our ant colony to remove all the florets from this broccoli head? What do you think, Nat? 
Oh, I don't know, Liv. Maybe an hour? I know these leaf cutting ants can cut pretty fast. We'll be re revisiting this during the break. So audience, put your guesses in the chat and we'll see if anyone gets close to the actual number. So in this round, we learned that ants definitely have numbers on their size side. It's crazy how big their colonies are. And they're all sisters. And meanwhile, stick insects. How about parthenogenesis? It's really cool how, how much female energy there is in the lab with all of these girls. I'm curious about other cool things your insects can do, which brings me to question two. What are your warrior's hidden talents and tricks? Let's stay with Team Ant, this time hearing from Victor. Victor, what can you tell us? Thanks, Nestle. It's my pleasure to reveal not one, not two, but three hidden talents from the leafcutter ants. Their first talent is their ability to navigate using chemical trails. Like many insects, leafcutter ants have very poor vision, so you might wonder how they manage to find their way to and from the nest, especially since these ants aren't just going on a brisk stroll. Their foraging trails can be up to 30 meters long, or roughly 3,000 3, times their body length. That's like an average human walking about five kilometers while blindfolded. Their secret weapon for never getting lost, pheromones. Worker ants can release and detect pheromones, which is often a mixture of chemicals to guide each other to the right destination. In the natural environment, leafcutter ants also physically clear a path for their foraging trail and keep it free from obstruction, much like how we have highway maintenance crews. The second hidden talent that you may not have heard of is that leafcutter ants have evolved social immunity. Social immunity describes behaviors that provide the colony with an extra level of protection against pathogens. One example of social immunity is the separation of the living from the dead. When an ant dies, workers separate it from the rest of the colony, much like how we have morgues in hospitals. Here too, ants rely on their chemo reception or their ability to sense chemicals to perform this grim task. So how does this work? Dead ants smell different to living members. So once a dead ant is identified, a worker will carry it away to the waste chamber. That's right, our ants are very tight. As ants don't rely on visual cues when making this decision, if you made a healthy living member smell like a dead ant, it will be carried away as it flails around, kicking and screaming. The final trick ants have up their sleeves is their fecal massa, or <clears throat> poo. You've already heard that leafcutter ants bring back plant fragments for their crop, a special fungus that grows on the fragments, which is then eaten by the ants. What's crazy is that when an ant eats some fungus, there are enzymes, which are proteins with specific functions, synthesized by the fungus that are not degraded on their journey through the ant's digestive tract. Later on, when the worker is processing leaf fragments, it poops on it, thereby releasing the fungal enzymes that then help to degrade the plant material and assist the growth of more fungi. I tried to come up with a good analogy from humans, but things got gross pretty quickly. So I'm going to save you the trouble and hope that my explanation is clear enough. Alrighty, I don't know about everyone else, but these hidden talents sound pretty hard to top. Still want to give it a go, Team Sticks, or just throw in the towel? Oh, do you think that's impressive? Well, Team Ants needs a little bit more aces up their sleeves to stand a chance. You said three? Okay, let's do that. Number one, let's start with camouflage. Well, insects often need to blend in with their environment to stay safe. If they're invisible, they can't be eaten. Stick insects belong to the order of Phasmatodia, and as a true Greek, I feel it is my duty to inform you that Phasmatodia comes from the Greek word phasma, meaning phantom. So there you go. That's one of the stick insect superpowers, invisibility. Their camouflage might be as simple as a slim body shape, mimicking a twig, and some dark coloring. However, their camouflage can also be very elaborate. Some stick insects have stripes, spots, or other patterns that make them look like leaves, rock, tree bark, and all sorts of other things. The better they blend in with their environment, the less likely they are to be somebody's dinner. 
As an example, in this image, you show um, a stick insect that is hiding within the tree bark. Can you find it? OK, let me help you out a bit. What about now? There it is. OK, number two. Another one of the hidden talents is that um, stick insects can, can blend in with their environment by mimicking their environment. Sticks can mimic other insects such as ants. And in this picture, you see the stick doing a pretty good job. Um, and they can also mimic other cuter parts of nature, such as leaves. OK, can you guess how many stick insects are in the picture below? We'll leave that slide up for a bit longer. And you can send your estimates in the chat. And we will reveal the answer in the halftime coming up. For now, the third hidden talent. Unlike popular belief, stick insects don't just stay still, but they're also excellent dancers. They move graciously like leaves in the wind. OK, that is another part of their camouflage, but we'd say that they're excellent dancers. So for example, on the left hand side, you see a, a fifth instar of an Indian stick insect dancing to Feliz Navidad. Wait, what? You can't hear it? Why did you think we added on the Christmas hat? OK, fair enough. On the right hand side, you can also see one of its sisters. Um, however, it's sadly missing one leg, but it can still dance the night away. OK, so while the Indian stick insects are clearly pop music fans, the sunny stick insects are trained from a young age from my friend Hendrik here to become ballerinas. So what have we said in conclusion is that the superpowers of the stick insects are invisibility, deception, and sick dance moves. So how can the sticks not be the coolest? Wow, thanks, Maria. Some good stuff this round. Ants may have power poo, but what about these dancing sticks and how well they can hide in leaves? Audience, what are your thoughts? Throw in the comments which talents and secret trick you would want to have. So let's return to the broccoli. Uh, some of you are close, some of you are far. I saw a lot of um, answers in the order of minutes. I saw a few in the order of hours. But, drum roll please, the answer was two and a half hours. So I didn't see anyone totally on that, but you got, Sam got close with two hours. So congrats to Sam. All right, moving on to the leaf question. How many do you think are in here? I'll give you a second longer to look in this because this is a little bit trickier. Um, oh. And what do you guys think? How many leaves in this image? How many leaf insects in this image? 23, we got four. 13, okay. We got a lot of high numbers. Very high with 100. All right, drum roll please. The number is nine. Uh, when I did this, I actually only guessed five, so I was pretty off. But I'm happy to see that some of you were pretty close. All right, moving on. As promised, everyone in the audience will have an opportunity to vote. And to do this, it's super easy. Either click the link in the chat or go to menti.com and then enter this code, 68789984. Or you can just scan this QR code and it'll take you right there where you'll get to vote. So you'll only have one opportunity to vote. So make sure you're ready with your choice. Um, but if you're not ready yet, don't worry. We have more content to help you decide. And our next segment should definitely help you decide because now we're going to take a break from the questions and move on into the ultimate insect battle. We have some incredibly talented members of the lab group and in particular, we had Liv writing this rap, and she'll be joined by Andrea, who will be performing it. And uh, somebody else in the lab, Fabian Plume, helped produce the video. So without further ado, let's see it.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's the moment you've been waiting for. The ultimate insect battle. Leaf cutting ants versus clinging sticks. Here we go! Welcome to our show. We need no introduction. We're the superorganism as described by Wilson. Leaf cuts are in the name, yeah. We harvest plant matter. When our jaws snap, we make our insect foes run scatter. Yo, now we've got your attention. Here's a few things that we ought to mention. Our colony is split into different castes, each specific subgroup having distinctive tasks. Our large upper soldiers, yeah, protect the pack, with our working foragers carrying 50 times their body mass. So sticks, you should be scared. Go run, go scream. And now you know our worth, bow down to the queen. Wow, so aggressive. Be calm. Go chill. It's hard to attack when you can see you're standing still. Yeah, we stick insects. Mass is a camouflage. Try find us in the wild, you'll see who's still in charge. Stick in the name, there's a bit of a clue. A deer to a surfaces. You think we use glue? Close your eyes for a second and blink, you'll see too. We clone ourselves to take on all you cut and menaces. For real, the process called what? Pathenogenesis. Stop. Can I get a girl, girl power? power? Our all-female colony works, we never tire. We cut the leaves, feed our fungus, watch our colony grow. Meanwhile, you're stuck in a tree, moving side to side real slow. Our wrap's nearly over yet, yeah, it's almost time to go, but if you still don't know who's best, remember the Neotropics principal pest. Did you just say pest like it's something to brag about? We kept our pets, we're keeping our wits about. Even when we nap, we're loved and adored And honestly, your rap, it got us kind of bored Did I forget to mention that some of us can fly Catch your eye in the air while we're soaring through the sky It's a bird, it's a branch, it's a plane Now it's team steak insects, so please get out my lane You know it is Yeah, you know it is, you know it is All right. What did you guys think about that? Let us know in the chat below. I think it should go viral. I've definitely had it stuck in my head all day since we first heard it. Some of the my favorite parts are Neotropics, Principal Insect Pest, also Superorganism as described by Wilson. So good. Such good representation of ants. And let's get into the results of the poll so far. So it looks like we have Team Stick in front so far. That's exciting. Um, we'll see how this changes throughout the event. Looks like Team Ant are increasing more. So we'll revisit this. And if you haven't voted, we're going to have more questions to let you Pick a side, and we'll revisit this at the end. All right, let's give the team a chance to answer more questions. So moving on to question three, what does the Evo Biomet group hope to learn by studying these insects? Let's go with Team Sticks first. Maria, what can you tell us? Yay, the winning team first. <laughs> Thanks, Nat. Um, I would love to share some of our recent, recent work so as you've heard by now, insects can stubbornly stick to surfaces, even upside down during a storm, a heat wave, or intense wind. Yet they can also unstick swiftly when they're trying to escape a predator. How do they do that? How do they stick and they don't get stuck? We work with live stick insects. They're friendly, they're nocturnal, and they're taking their signature, a mistake pose. Um, and we firstly focus on their legs, and then more specifically, we focus on their foot pads, which is what helps them attach. It turns out that they have wet feet, um, and that means that they leave behind a liquid footprint. But we don't know, does that liquid flow easily like water? And if so, how do they not slip and fall? Or is it more honey-like? In which case, why do they insects not get stuck? So we want to study the physical properties of the liquid to understand its role in insect attachment, 
but each one of the footprints only leaves behind a very tiny amount. To give you an idea, we would need to collect a liquid from five trillion footprints to make up a pint of sticky foot juice. Uh, so we'd rather not do that. Instead, what we do is we look at the very thin continuous film of this liquid that is transformed into droplets. You might be aware of something similar happening in your shower, for example. When the liquid is dropped onto most surfaces, it doesn't want to stay continuous and it uh, then spreads and uh, it creates small droplets here and there. So how does that uh, process happen and how quickly does it happen? We can measure the speed at which the film breaks apart and we can connect that to the physical properties of the liquid. And that's namely surface tension, which is how badly the liquid doesn't want to be continuous, and viscosity, which is responsible for Winnie the Pooh not being able to hide his honey cravings. By determining these physical properties of the liquid, we can then figure out the forces that are involved in the sweat attachment system and how the insects manage to tune them to their advantage. However, since we're trying to figure out how the stick insects are able to climb without sticking, another question pops up. How do they actually climb? Like most insects, on a horizontal plane, they walk in a so-called tripod gait. That means that they have three feet on the ground and three feet on the air at all times during a stride. So if you were to draw a line connecting the feet that have the, the ground contact, you would see a support pattern that resembles a triangle, as we've shown in this slide. Um, in this, but this presents a particular problem as they start climbing at different inclines. So imagine you're trying to walk up a hill of increasing in incline. You would need to adopt your body posture in order to avoid toppling backwards. So to study how the sticks deal with the different angle, uh, angles of inclination, we move out of the boulder gym and we build a rotational platform on which we film them from five different perspectives. Later, we can automatically track their body parts and joints using neural networks and reconstruct their locomotion in 3D. In this way, we are able to calculate their joint angles and observe their walking patterns in detail and analyze how they deal with the challenge of climbing at different inclines. And finally, as a last step, we project the observed tricks of the sticks onto a six-legged robot to directly measure which effects these adaptations have in the real world. Um, okay, team ants. Your turn. Give me some cool science facts. I'd be more than happy to, because we have so much to share. It may be obvious by now that a large part of our lab is crazy about leaf cutterants. That's why there are multiple PhD students and postdocs studying these ants to understand how they work, both at the level of the individual and of the colony as a whole. At the individual level, we're studying questions like how do foragers cut the materials? This video zooms in on a busy forager that is using her mandibles or jaws to chew or slice their way through plants. Do leaf cutter ants have super sharp teeth to help them out? How strongly, that is, with how much force, can they bite? And how do, how do they use their muscles to move their sharp mandibles? After all, you could have rather blunt knives, but use a lot of force or you can have very sharp knives that can cut with less force, but then they will get dull pretty quickly and can be damaged more easily. So what happens with leaf cutter ants? We have a number of custom built setups in the lab to investigate these questions, including a bite force sensor to measure how strongly ants can do this, as well as a more sensitive force sensor setup that can detect the small forces needed to slice through plants or other materials using ant mandibles. We are also interested in understanding the amount of energy these ants spend while cutting. After all, it does look like they are putting in a lot of effort to cut. Can we quantify this? And how does this compare to other activities such as walking or flight? Previous studies have estimated the, the maximum sustainable metabolic rate of non-flying animals 
to be between 8 to 12 times greater than their resting metabolic rate. When cutting leaves, leaf cutter ants can sustain a meta metabolic rate that is more than 30 times their resting rate, which, is, which clearly demonstrates how energetically costly it is to cut leaves. In fact, this means leaf cutting can be as taxing as other immensely costly activities, such as insect flight. Of course, each individual ant is only a tiny fraction of the whole colony, a small cog in the wheel. So how do thousands of these workers coordinate themselves? Think of it like doing chores in the house. Someone needs to take out the rubbish, someone else needs to cook, tend to the babies or children, and go grocery shopping. Unlike humans, ants can't really speak to each other, and there is no single central authority figure to dictate what each of them does. So how do they divvy up the work so effectively? Can we learn from them and teach our siblings so we don't squabble about who does the dishes? As we mentioned earlier, leaf cutter ants are polymorphic, which means the ants come in a wide range of sizes. Remember the chihuahuas versus an English mastiff. Do different sized workers forage at different rates? How does the type of food change the forage composition? To answer these questions, we need to track foraging ants and know their weights as well, which would be really laborious to do by hand, one ant at a time. So we're working on developing automated methods capable of identifying ant weights and their foraging activities. Answers to these questions will help us understand not only the cues that guide complex social behavior, they may also be useful for certain applications in our society, which we will cover next. All right, thank you, Victor. Some really cool research going on, although I think I'd rather have a pint of science over a pint of sticky foot juice. What do you guys think? I also know those ant mandibles are no joke. Um, working in the lab, I get quite a few bites, and if those big soldiers bite you, they will definitely draw blood. So I have a question for you, audience. Would you rather drink a pint of sticky foot juice or get bitten by a thousand ants? While you're thinking about what fate you would choose, let's move on to question four, the final question. And that's about why should we care? These facts may be cool, but what is the wider impact on society from studying these insects and what are you hoping to gain from this work? So let's start with Team Ant. Liv, what can you tell us? Thanks, Nat. Uh, I know you guys probably might be thinking, well, yeah, like ants are cool and like so much better than sticks and that poll was totally rigged. I get it. But why should I care and what's the point in researching them? Well, turns out society can actually stand a lot to learn from our queens. And although we don't have all the time in the world now, here are just a few uh, of the big picture reasons why studying ants are so important. As we've discussed previously, ants live in groups, much like humans, yet they operate without centralized control. Although there is the queen, she does little but lay eggs and is not telling the colony uh, in any way how to behave. Understanding how ants coordinate themselves in these complex systems serves as, serves as an inspiration in numerous fields. An example would be um, managing traffic jams in crowded conditions. The video to uh, my right shows the ants effortlessly zipping in between each other. And even though there are distinctive differences in flow, there are no collisions between workers. Studying how ants manage congestion could potentially help us with managing our own congestion on highways with autonomous cars. To provide an example more specific to the leaf cutters would be their use of antimicrobials. Leaf cutter ants use antimicrobials to help manage pests on the fungal crops. Now, interestingly, ants have been doing this for millions of years, and despite their prolonged use, don't seem to be dealing with any form of antimicrobial resistance. Posing the question, could ants teach us better disease management and pest control? And finally, although not directly specific to ants, we hope that by showing you all the things we can learn from such shiny, amazing creatures, we want to raise appreciation and awareness for our insect friends. Remember, today we've only really spoken about two ant species, and in general there are thousands of others, not to mention the millions of other species that are classified as insects. Imagine what we could learn as a society if we studied all these creatures in detail. Now, a lot of you will be aware that in recent years, there has been a surge in deforestation, overpopulation and pollution, 
all of which contributes to habitat shrinkage, which thus um, contributes to a loss of biodiversity. If we were to leave you with one thing from our show, it would be that we need to protect biodiversity so we can continue to learn from these amazing tiny creatures. So speaking of learning amazing things from tiny creatures, what have you got, Team Stick? Well, what impact does stick insects research have on society, you ask us? Well, where do I even start? In short, very short, our research on the attachment of sticks to surfaces and their locomotion can inspire yoga and dance teachers, such as Abby here, to create a yoga class. Here's an extract from her show as part of the Imperial Lates and Public Engagement Program. If you feel like giving it a go, just click on the link posted in the comments. Also, the footpads of insects can lead to biomimetic interfaces that are relevant for bioadhesives, for example. Here, you see a tape that has fibrillus, similar to the hairs found on the footpads of some insects. But the applications don't stop at morphology. Learning how insects manage to tune adhesion and friction can be crucial for implantable devices, drug delivery systems, and tissue engineering applications. Last but not least, Knowledge of insect locomotion can be very useful for the next generation of robots. Imagine, advances in the field of robotics allow machines to perform increasingly complex tasks. For example, they can be used in search and rescue missions, inspection tasks, or conduct remote exploration on different planets. These robots might not be um, more efficient in what they do, but they also protect humans from exposing themselves in dangerous environments. To be successful in an outdoor mission, a robot must not only overcome rough terrain, but must also be able to deal with different inclines. Well, for instance, previous Mars exploration missions have not been able to investigate crater walls due to the limited climbing abilities of its rovers. Now, whether a robot is supposed to navigate a different slope on Mars, um, inspect a construction site, or explore collapsed buildings, we hope to improve the mobility of robots in the future by understanding how stick insects adapt their kinematics. Well, are you still not decided whom to vote for? Let me introduce you to someone who is really keen to meet you. Have you noticed our little friend in the background? Well, he sure noticed you, so vote for Team Sticks. Wow, amazing. I did not notice that stick insect back there. That was a great trick at the end, Team Stick. I'll give you that. Um, I don't know what to say about this because ants are still the best. All right, so we're done with our questions now. So we're gonna move into your questions. I'm gonna bring everyone back on the screen and we're gonna field some of the questions that we got from your comments on YouTube. Hi guys, Hello. thanks for answering my questions. I hope you can answer the audience's questions. Let's start with Sam, who asks, do sticky feet work even if your surface is absorbent? So Team Stick, what can you tell us about this question? Okay, so um, we are mainly, um, I'm mainly studying how stick insects perform, uh, perform in smooth surfaces. Uh, because normally, as I, as I introduced it to you, we would expect them to either stick um, due to the honey-like secretion or slip because of the um, the water component of the secretion. Um, but I guess if a surface is ab absorbent, so for example, if it has some porosity, then that would also have some roughness. And if the surface is rough, which is why Hendrik is looking at, um, the sick insects would engage their claws, so they, were, they would be able to use them to also stick to surfaces. I Thanks for that. that. That answer, Maria. That was a good answer. All right. We have another question. Again, for the stick insect team, seeming like there's a lot of interest in the sticks here. Thanks for the insights. I have two questions regarding the tarsal adhesive fluid of stick insects. Does the viscosity change over time after secretion? And do you check both our luium and you plan to lay? What can so, um, I have done viscosity measurements over time, and we, um, Andrea, who is performing the wrap, has done uh, surface tension measurements over time. 
And with the equipment that we have, we haven't seen any difference in the velocity with time. So we can we assume that, that might be related to the fact that there is little evaporation. So the chemical composition remains the same and then the viscosity stays constant constant with time. Um, however, what we do study is how the viscosity changes with temperature because the sick insects experience a daily temperature fluctuation from 20 to 50 degrees. So we want to see how the properties of the liquid itself change. And then uh, if they change, then how would the forces change? And how do they still manage to stay despite that temperature fluctuation? Um, as for your second question, thanks so much uh, actually for asking questions. Um, I personally haven't done any work on, I've only worked on that earlier. So yeah, smooth pads of the Indian sick insect. Thanks. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, I hope that answered your question. Uh, and we have, I think, two more questions from the audience. So moving on to ZSMY, um, who asked, who, how do ants not bump into each other when working together. So, Team Ants, um, does Victor or Lib? Do either of you want to answer? How about? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can at least uh, start it off. Um, so, how do ants not bump into each other? That's quite interesting. When you look at our ant colonies, um, you do you do see some pretty much collisions, or sometimes you see the soldier ants, which are much bigger ones, almost just climb over the smaller forages. Um, so we do see a bit of that sometimes. Um, but uh, for now, I think that they uh, are very good at detecting um, vibrations. And they, again, use their chemical reception to, um, to more or less avoid each other. But it's not to say that they don't at all. Um, they do bump and climb over each other all the time. Okay, thank you, Vixer. Liv, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, I would say as well that um, having looked into this, it's still like very much an open question as well. And I know um, from the pictures shown on the slides that in their natural hierarchy, they have the, you can almost see like clear channels of flow, especially. So, um, but like Victor says, from our own, um, in like, seeing them in the lab ourselves, like it's not as clear cut as we want the video for them to see really. They do kind of just kind of headbutt each other and <laughs> when they're going about their daily life. All right, interesting. Okay, so let's get on to more of the questions. I think we had more coming through and we'll try to get to all of them that we can. Photo Tote Bag says, thank you. Can you expand on the special fungus leaf cutters cultivate? Do colonies seek out existing mycelium to build on? Team Ant, another question for you. Victor, do you want to start us off again? Yeah, sure. Um, so at least for Atta genus, um, they do have a specific strain of fungus that they um, have cultivated. And like we said, uh, you can't find this anywhere else. Um, and they, the queens actually take some of this fungus with them when they start off um, on the, sorry, the, the new queens, when they start off on a new colony, they take some of this with them. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess that um, helps to answer your question. Um, maybe, I don't, I don't know if Natalie, you want to add anything to this or Liv? Yeah, Liv, do you have anything? Um, not on this one, no. Okay, yeah, I can say, uh, Victor pretty much covered it, and it's really cool in that this fungus is often passed from mother daughter mother colony to daughter colony, and the future queens will take a small packet with them, which I think is so cool. And some of these species of fungi you don't find free living, as previously mentioned in this work. Okay, uh, let's get to some more questions. Andrea is asking specifically a question for Hendrik, so I hope you can answer this, Hendrik. What's the smallest size stick insect robot you hope to make given current technological limitations? 
Well, it would be ab absolutely amazing to actually build a life-sized model. Um, but then again, for a, for a stick insect, what is life-size? As I showed earlier, the smallest adult that you can find in the wild is just two centimeters. And imagine, um, whereas the biggest one gets up to 60 centimeters, which is uh, doable if I employ um, servo motors. But in the long term, I think it would be fascinating to use some kind of artificial um, shortening wire as a artificial muscle to yeah really size that robot down. Cool. I hope that answers your question, roughly. Yeah, awesome. That sounds amazing. Um, thanks, Hendrik, for answering that question. And we have another question from James. How do the behaviors of a singular ant isolated from the colony differ from working inside the colony? See, Matt, question for you. So I could probably start this one off just from uh, based on my observations. Um, I know that the when you isolate an ant from its colony, it kind of shows very different behaviors to that what it would, which it would exhibit within the colony. For example, often for my um, metabolic rate measurements, we typically isolate an ant. Um, and as Victor says, um, ants are, communicate quite clearly with um, chemoreceptors. And so when the ant smells differently and is placed back into the colony, it's actually attacked. Um, also to bear in mind, when you isolate an ant from a colony, it shows um, elevated levels of stress at which it would, wouldn't do when normally with its sisters and you get the, the kind of the feedback from the nest as well. If you have anything to add, Victor. Yeah, I, I think you covered most of it. Just a small thing. Um, it is actually possible to take a sub-colony if you have fungus and brood. But um, I, I think we've seen that if you don't have the brood in there, um, so brood as in the uh, larva and the pupae, um, if you don't have it in there, the ants don't really look after the fungus and then eventually they start dying. Um, so yeah, that's a bit sad, but um, as we want to emphasize, these are social insects um, and they really do belong together in the colony. Um, so yeah, whenever we do experiments, we separate them for a bit and then return them where we can. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Liv and Victor. Uh, I think that was a good answer to the question. I don't have too much more to add. Uh, we'll move into Marie's question. Do stick insects communicate? We just heard about ant communication. What can Team Stick tell us? Well, stick insects have uh, really poor vision, but they have a very good um, sense. So they do um, kind of smell each other, but they also um, can communicate with each other by vibrating or, um, yeah, and kind of transmitting sound and thereby warn each other to, I don't know, avoid predation or um, if someone is trying to get in a new uh, fresh bramble uh, stick. Great answer. Maria, do you have anything else to say? And you yeah. pretty much covered it. All right. Um, we have another question from Jonas on ants. How do ants differentiate into different types like warriors and queens? Team ant, what can you tell us about development of different ants? I can I can start us off. Um, I was just going to say that, uh, as we said before, they are actually all sisters. So there's the queen, and then she lays the eggs, and they are sisters. And how they dif differentiate into the really tiny workers and the large soldiers, um, the major workers. Um, that is that is a very good question. And some of it has is, is, is complicated. And honestly, there are many factors to it. Um, but one of them seems to be how much it's fed. So uh, the more the larva is fed during the development, um, the more likely it is to develop into, let's say, like a soldier. Um, and yeah, I, I was wondering, maybe Natalie, you want to add something to that? Yeah, Victor, um, I think that's a big factor is how much food it gets fed by its nestmates during development. Um, the age of the colony also plays a factor into whether an ant is going to develop into a future queen or even a male. Um, so colonies have to be a certain age to be able to start reproducing and um, produce these queens that will fly off to a new colony and start their own. Um, and 
that also has to do with kind of the care that it receives um, during its development. All right, let's move on to another question that I think we have for Team Ants from Jonah, which is, does a colony cultivate a monoculture or different types of fungi? What do the ants do to tend it? All right, Team Ants. Cool. Uh, thanks, Jonah. Um, I, I actually have a, um, well, I studied fungus for a little bit, so I can take this one. Um, so the arts at least have, let's say, a primary um, type or cultivar fungus that they do feed on and they cultivate. Um, and that is the one that we described earlier where uh, you can't find it anywhere else and the ants can't live without it. What's interesting is that um, you can, people, scientists have found other uh, mi microbes, so not just fungus, but also bacteria um, within the uh, fungus, uh, within the, the main strain of fungus. Um, I think the um, it's still unclear if these other strains, these other species of fungus and microbes um, are uh, eaten or if they're there kind of a bit more as a pathogen. Um, but the ants are very fastidious. They're very, the amount of husbandry that they put into um, taking care of their fungus is extreme. So it's, it's uh, probably that they're not pathogens, so they might but just be there without having a huge negative effect. Um, but yeah, so again, primarily one type that they eat, but you can find um, other spores and other bacteria there. Um, I think one paper has found different types of yeast in there as well, um, but it's, this is like a tiny, like a tiny fraction of it. The majority is a, a specific strain, at least in the Atta. Cool, thanks, Victor. And I just want to add to that point that not even just with the leaf cutters and ants, there's a lot of microbes within the colony, and it is kind of an unexplored area of the diversity of microbes that can be maintained inside an ant colony, which is a really cool direction that I think research could go in. All right, I think we're gonna end the questions. Um, thank you guys for participating so much throughout. Uh, we really enjoyed seeing all of your comments and seeing you get excited about everything. It was really fun. Uh, I hope you enjoyed everything that we presented for you guys. Before we end, I want to show the results of the poll to see who is winning. And Yay. it looks like Team Stick pulled ahead, not by a huge margin, but we had a total of 76 voters, which is exciting. Thank you guys for participating. I think those people that didn't decide probably should have picked Team Ants because it would have brought it a little closer. Um, but I don't pick sides here. What am I saying? <laughs> And with that, I want to give thanks to the other members of our lab group, um, all of them who contributed in some way, whether it was through their research or Andrea, who you saw during the wrap, Bobby, who was behind the scenes creating that video. Um, we also have Freddie, who put in some of the images here. And I also want to extend a thank you to Fabian, who I just mentioned, and Andrea. And then also the people running this behind the scenes. So we have Josh and Kate, Josh who is producing, making sure we all come in frame and out of frame at the right time. And Kate who is monitoring your comments and feeding them to us. So thanks so much to you guys. And with that, thanks for attending. Um, and Team Ants rule, what can I say? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Team Stick. Just kidding, just kidding. Team Stick, they won by a popular vote, right? I can't even support team ant anymore with the group all right thanks everyone for attending thank you thank you have a good evening <laughs>